welcome up Vince Kadluba. Um, really incredible crowd here today. Thank you for coming out. Thank you for um, wanting to hear me speak. And thank you to Creative Mornings for having me speak on this subject. This is a subject that's actually incredibly close <laughs> to my heart. Um, the subject of chaos. Um, and thank you to Denver Startup Week for having me. I've been here all week since Sunday. It's been an incredible uh, week of really feeling like Denver is a home, um, starting to become a home, um, learning about the city and learning about people who live here. And it's, um, it's awesome. Um, it's a really brilliant city um, that I think has a part of this conversation too, and an important part of this conversation as well. Um, and I want to thank also Creative Startups. It was mentioned a couple times already, but we did go through a, uh, an accelerator, Creative Startups Accelerator. And um, it was their inaugural year, and you know, there's not that many creative economy accelerators. Usually tech, usually you know, more classic kind of startup business. But this was really taking like artists, artists' ideas, and then training them to think about their work as a business. And it's a really touching subject. And in a lot of ways, it's exactly what we're talking about here. It's the chaos of creativity, the chaos of artists, the chaos of artistic ideas and artistic expression, and the order of business. And bridging that gap completely changed my life. And I, 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 uh, I just encourage all creatives in the room wondering about how to start their creative business um, to go to creativestartups.org and apply because the, uh, the, this accelerator is uh, happening again in Albuquerque and hopefully we'll be coming to Denver here soon as well. So uh, you can apply for the Albuquerque one and it's an incredible experience. So thank you Alex Lloyd, Tom Magnuson, and the whole Creative Startups group for what you've done. So I'm going to try to get through this as fast as I possibly can because I want to get to Q&A. So it might be a kind of a chaotic presentation. It's a fucking massive conversation to have around chaos. Uh, and it matters a lot. And also, I just want to let you know that I'm a little bit nervous because I'm wearing one ankle like sock and one non-ankle sock because I could not find I couldn't find my other sock this morning. Um, I was like, what is going on? What is the deal with socks? Um, I didn't plan that moment, by the way. Like, this moment that just happened wasn't planned. Um, I just happened to look down and saw a little bit of skin showing. And I had been nervous about this moment and be like, oh my god, everyone's going to see my ankle. And um, so then in the midst of my presentation, I like looked down and I saw that and I'm like, oh shit, I'm just, I'm just gonna say it out loud. Um, but this is actually, I think, an important part of the conversation is, is, is what that was, what that moment was. Because I had a planned presentation. There's, a, there's an element of planned and order to this, to this conversation. But it's in those moments of chaos, moments of spontaneity, where there's connection that can happen, where people say like, oh shit, that's, that's genuine. That's authentic. Um, and I honestly didn't plan it, even though it now seems like I did. Um, so here's a gradient. Humans are funny about chaos and order, because we actually have, like, whatever it is going on in our brains, we have the ability to sort of like understand this concept of order and chaos. Nature doesn't give a fuck about these, con these concepts. Nature is just like, 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 is a forest chaotic, or is a forest order? Is a hurricane chaos, or is a hurricane order? Is the universe chaos, or is the universe order? It's like, nature doesn't give a shit. It's the same. It's happening at the same time. For humans, because of our ability to talk and language, whatever, it, we start to separate these things, and we go between the, the two. Um, and for some reason, the words on this slide are not on it. And there's really important words on this slide. <laughs> See, look, two slides. So this is really not planned. <laughs> Seriously not planned. All right. I will just speak to it. That sucks. All right. So the thought here for me in, that, in those two slides is that order, I was kind of connecting some words and some concepts. So order being, order is like planned, Order is um, safe. Order 
is containment. Um, order is structure. So if we could have all of those sort of concepts together. The other slide. The other side said, said in big pink letters in the middle, said the juice. Uh, and the words around it were chaos being spontaneity, chaos being authenticity, or spontaneity being authenticity, and authenticity being freedom. And, and maybe I also had the word spirit instead of freedom. But I don't want to get too much into spirituality here, but there is a sense of spirited and authentic and spontaneous and chaos all sort of being together. Now, I'm, I'm not a fan of one or the other. I don't think that like everybody should be chaotic all the time because that's where the spirit is and that's where the, that's where the authenticity is. It's like, no, I mean, if that was the case, it'd be, it, you know, we, we know some people like that, right? And it's like, <laughs> get some order in your life, you know? Bring some order into it. Uh, so anyway, that's the framework. I'm going to get through these slides pretty fast. Um, and, and it's going to be sort of around how we came to be. So Meow Wolf is a very kind of structured business right now. It's not at all how it started. In 2008, we were an art collective. We were in a warehouse. We had no structure. We were had no money. We were just a bunch of 20-somethings who wanted to make art and throw music shows and have a clubhouse. And so we had this like, you know, we had this like 2,000 square foot building, and the building was um, didn't have insulation. And it was too cold in the winters and too hot in the summers. And we would just basically get a bunch of trash together. Get a bunch of like trash together that we pull out of dumpsters that we got donated to us, and then we would put them put this stuff up in you know different sorts of like sculptural uh, elements. And we would open these shows to the public, and people would be crawling around on floors that they really shouldn't be crawling around on. Um, <laughs> like kids and families would show up to our openings. And, um, but, but they loved it, and they loved the sort of like just what, what really felt like, you know, a lot of spontaneity, a lot of authenticity, a lot of just sort of like people figuring it out. And there was an energy there that people really responded to. Um, but of course, there was the, the ordered parts of this was like, you couldn't just be a bunch of artists in a warehouse just collecting garbage and putting it up on walls. We also, from my perspective, we needed to like give these projects a name. So like this, this project here that I've been showing pictures of was called Geodecadent. And we had to think about things like, you know, this is a nice an actual like, couch that's hanging off of a, uh, uh, off of a dome. Um, and we had to like think about like how, how, to, how do we secure that? You know, we have to have some, some amount of structure to be able to make sure that like that couch doesn't fall on a child. Um, and so, we also have to have, and like in my, from my perspective, we had to have like a date that we opened the show. So we would open the show on whatever, August 15th. And we have to have flyers, and we have to make those flyers, and those flyers need to get to the appropriate places. And then when people come in and see our show, even though it's like a den of, you know, chaos and sin, basically, um, we, also, we also want to try to make money off this, I think. I was like, you guys want to make money? Are you guys trying to make money off this? Are you trying to like, support the space by asking people to put money in a box? And people are like, oh, no, 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 no. For some reason, like, money and business was too much structure. You know, it was like too much. Like, no, 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 we're artists. Like, we're not doing it for that. We're not doing it for money. We're, we're artists. Hate being starving artists. Why are there so many starving artists in the world? But no, we're not going to take money. <laughs> um, I was like, let's just put a box out, like a cardboard box. And we can just put, like, we don't have to say the word donations. We can make a funny word out of it. Just like, I don't know, just let's do a code word or something. So I was trying to convince the group, and we finally ended up doing that kind of stuff. And most people would put like $100, you know, by the end of the night, and we would spend it on beer. And <laughs> so we did this for a while, this for like four or five years. This project came along, and this was a really spectacular project because it was a theater project. And it's called The Moon is to Live On. And we did this in 2010. And it was a Two rotating sets. It was a three-hour-long play. It was um, three screens on the fourth wall. And the thing about theater is that it has to be structured. Like, you can't just staple a bunch of stuff on the wall and then invite people into your space. And so the theater piece, it has a script, it has a director. The uh, players need to follow that script. 
the uh, sets rotated, so like we needed to have the proper rotations at the proper time, and it, it's like it's tight. And so what we did is we built we, we we had a script that basically had like moments that were meant to be chaos moments, but the rest of the script was a container that held those chaos moments within it. And those chaos moments were justified as dream sequences of the main character. So it was like within this concept, within this structure, there was the opportunity to justify more chaotic expression. Um, but this was the first time that the, that the group had done something that of real like structural significance like that. And it helped. It really helped us understand who we were. Um, doing a lot of shows that started to get more form, started to have more of that order brought into the, into the mix. Um, this is actually an interesting sculpture though. It's like the obvious thing would be like the obvious thing would be to just do the cloud and put the lights in the cloud. And I think we've probably all seen a lot of these in the last four or five years of like clouds that are lit up from the inside. But the artist Katie Kennedy was like, I'm gonna put these little like thorny things on the side. It's like there's really no reason why, because it's a cloud, and clouds don't have thorny things like that on the side. But her moment of spontaneity was just like, yeah, you just put those things on it. And for us, like for me, like that makes it a much more interesting piece. Um, this is it's, God, super dark. Um, this is the Do Return. Uh, this is a project that followed the theater piece. And again, the theater piece really helped us think as a structured, ordered group. And this is the show that really got us to start to like define how our, what our, like really start to define and talk openly about our concept around chaos and order. And this is now a theme within our company, like very much so, we talk about it all the time. Um, but this taught us that like, you can build a ship, you can build a, a, you know, we can build a ship. The ship itself is a contained, designed, planned structure and that structure is, has integrity. And it has integrity both from like a structural engineering perspective, like it can support the weight of people who are on it, like literally has integrity, and then also conceptually has integrity. So the ship has like a sort of structured integrity that anybody in this room can understand what a ship is. And, and so that allows within that structure, within that in integral structure, there's the opportunity to have whatever you want inside of it. And so if we build enough of an, of a, of an in integral structure around, uh, as, a, as a container, then the spaces within that container can be chaotic. The spaces within the container can be spontaneous. And so that's what we had. We had a bunch of rooms, we had a bunch of different bunk spaces, and this is where artists could basically do anything that they wanted. Um, and so we opened the show. Um, it was incredibly successful. Um, we had 25,000 visitors in, over the course of three months. Is, we, everybody worked on the show, volunteer hours, nobody got paid. $50,000 that we raised, like, basically selling lemonade and cookies to our relatives. Um, <laughs> that was essentially the way we, uh, we raised that money. Um, that's a really dark picture of the ship needing to be taken down. Um, and when, when that sh show came down, it was like, we thought for sure we had just like hit a home run in the art world. We just opened the show with 25,000 people. It's the most successful art show in the history of, of, of our city. And like we made it. Like everyone's gonna be calling us. We're gonna like Art Basel and Warhol Foundation, New York, Miami, Tokyo, and like and then we got like one call from Chicago with a 2,000 square foot uh, gallery in Chicago. It's like, hey, do you, you want to do a show in Chicago? We're like, yes, Chicago. Like, how much money you got? He's like, nothing. I don't got any money. All right, um, but basically, like we didn't know, we thought we had, we thought we had made it, you know, and um, we were trying to like write grants and like do the thing that artists do, um, grants and, and and kickstarters and kind of justifying the value of the work that you're doing through like some roundabout way, um, and and all the while like business, like was just such a dirty word. So we still weren't even like a, a, an organized, structured entity at this time. We were just a bunch of friends um, that called ourselves Meow Wolf. Um, so anyway, that, that period of time went on for a while until we met this guy, George R. R. Martin. Um, and I, I got, 
introduced to George because I put in an application for a marketing director position for a, an art house theater in Santa Fe called the Jean Cocteau. And George owns the Jean Cocteau, and I knew that. But when I put the application in, I didn't think that George would be the person who would be doing the interviews for that position. <laughs> um, and uh, his assistant was like, okay, you'll be interviewing with George next week. I was like, are you fucking kidding me? Um, <laughs> And so I was like, okay. So I like rallied a bunch of Meow Wolf materials together and you and kind of like started to talk to him about Meow Wolf and showed him the Dewey turn and and um, I ended up getting the job and then I got fired pretty quickly thereafter, um, about three months uh, later. Um, and and um, but but we had a good rapport, you and I, even though I got fired, we had a good a good rapport with each other. And um, I ended up pitching to him, hey, do you want to buy this for bowling alley? And um, he was like, no, not really. <laughs> I don't want to buy that bowling alley. Um, but he came, he came and he visited the site, and 30,000 square feet, 2.7 acres, total shambles, like old bowling alley um, in the center of, of Santa Fe. And at the time, we had no money. Like, we had zero dollars in, in our bank account. I was delivering food for $12 an hour. Um, None of us had gone to college, none of us really had a career in front of us, and it was like just such a long shot. Um, simultaneous to this, though, we started to, um, we did the Create a Startups program that I was talking about, and we started to think about like, okay, so if we did the do return, if we did this boat, and the boat got this many people, how many people could we have gotten had the boat stayed up? And if the boat would stay up like permanently? And, and who's our core demographic like, if we're going to do that? And what are some key components that we know we need to have? And started to just go through the whole process of basically laying out the vision of Meow Wolf. Um, so we started, so George said yes to buy the new building, and we started fundraising and had never done business before, never done a for profit thing, never had money, never had an employee, and started this whole process. And um, a big part of that was, of course, designing an actual show. So the architectural designs of the House of Eternal Return, this was like a, an, an incredibly huge step for our, our company. Um, in, and, go, and as you can tell, like going on the gradient of chaos to order, we're like definitely on, on that path. Um, this is one of our lead artists kind of interacting with the designs, um, seeing how it is that we went to sort of just like concepts to actual architectural concept art. And then we worked on the show for like a year and a half, basically. Um, within the context of this architectural um, schematic, but then also finding all of the pockets of things that we could just sort of um, do on a whim and do a spontaneity. Um, this is a good image of, you know, kind of like how inexperienced we were. This is the <laughs> <laughs> 19-year-old poetry major <laughs> drop out of college to join Meow Wolf, and then we're like, want to help us weld stuff? <laughs> uh, and really great story, this is Emily Marquis, and Emily is a total, total badass, and she's now one of our lead tech project managers on our tech team, um, having you know, just dropped out as a poetry major like two years ago. Um, this is probably like the most in touch with chaos person that I possibly know. If you guys don't know, his name is Benji Geary. And he is standing in the first um, design, truly designed um, sculptural thing that we had ever created, which was the Portals Bermuda. Um, we started to build, like again, that structural container. The house had to have a structural design to it. It had to. Um, but then moments like this, it's like, we need to cut a bus in half. How do we cut a bus in half and stand it up? Uh, and then the bus goes in. The bus has to go in first before the walls, because you can't put the walls. In. You can't bring the bus in after the walls have been put up. Um, anyway, we worked on this for like 14 months. Built the fridge, all of this stuff. Uh, opened in March of 2016, and really didn't know like what the reaction was going to be. Um, and through the entire process of this, it was like a constant, as a, as a project, it was a constant balance between like, like the chaos, which is like, we don't know what the hell is going on or how it's going to go in the future, and the other part of the brain that's like, no, we actually do know what's going to happen. We're going to like finish this thing, we're going to open the doors, and it's 
going to be bombed and people are going to love it and they're going to show up in, in masses. And, like, and you're like bouncing between those two constantly. Um, and honestly, if you're not bouncing between the two constantly, like, I don't think you're being authentic with yourself. I don't think, and I also don't think that you're going to get to the finish line. I think a lot of times people think that they just have to have the plans. And if they just follow the plans, that's going to work. But what happens when you get too dedicated to the order of things is that the moment chaos slips in, you, f you freak out because like chaos ha has no place in your, uh, in your creative process. And so you have to be able to be comfortable with both in order to get through projects like this. You have to both like have no idea how it's going to turn out and also be like, no, actually, I do know how it's going to turn out. But be comfortable when those moments come in that are like, oh shit, like, this thing is on the rocks again, you know? Um, anyway, we opened the show. I don't know how many people have been to the house return return, but it's a big uh, recording in the house, and basically audiences get the opportunity to like, walk into the front yard, and then they can go anywhere they want, uh, left, right, through the door, and then they can basically explore this family's um, history. And the family is part of a larger narrative that's like, basically something's happened in the family's house that has caused time and space to rip apart and for like the fifth dimension to be, act, uh, to be um, the fifth dimension is now, you know, available. And um, this is also like the, the story of the House of Return Returns between a family that's at the end of what we call the creative, uh, the creative bloodline and then versus the charter and the charter is on the like is the is the most recent like um, evolved species of the order uh, the, sort of the order bloodline and these are like opposing force they feel like opposing forces in our in this like vibrancy of humanity like you know like um, just like a good example would be like a, a third grader and his teacher his or her teacher. You know, like the teacher is very much like, no, stay on the path, be, you know, have order, like focus. And the kid's like, no, I want to be crazy. And like, that's a good example of like how they oppose in our world. But in our story, it's like, it's less about, it, it definitely is opposition at this level. But what it really is happening is it's a, it's a push and pull. It's a universal inhale, exhale, um, or like a pump trolley. I kind of think about it as a pump trolley. It's like order will come in and order will create kind of this pressure and this containment and this, there's like an, an oppression to it. And then the chaotic wants to be free of that. Like we're meant for balance between the two, but we kind of sway between it. And chaos will like respond with even better punk rock music and even better art um, and even better expression and progression. And then the, like too much of it then makes kind of containment come back. And that we've been doing this as a consciousness since maybe the beginning of time. And that maybe we're doing this as a consciousness from the beginning of time so that we can get back to a place where, as nature is, these are seamless. They're seamless. Chaos and order are seamless together. So the fridge is a very uh, great, like, apropos moment of, like, the fridge, the kitchen, very ordered, very predictable, very planned. We understand it. We know what it is. And then you open it, and it's like, oh, shit. Anything's possible. Total chaos. Anything can happen on the other side of this. And like that moment is so special to people. People like love it. They've seen it on Instagram a thousand times, but they still do it and they still freak out. Um, <laughs> or the or the dryer. So we really just kind of realized that people want to go through their household appliances. <laughs> That's the real discovery of this whole project. Um, and then once you go through your household appliances, you end up in this like totally crazy world um, where, where there's a lot of things that are designed and structured and ordered, and there's a lot of things that happen spontaneously. And um, again, that whole kind of like container leads to, leads to freedom. Containers support freedom. Containers support chaos. Um, and then you just, you know, it's 20,000 square feet. There's a lot of you guys just, just come to Santa Fe. It's really fun. Um, we have drinks, we have a bar, we have music shows, we have a bunch of rooms, we have musical instruments in here, just a bunch of stuff. This is our venue. Um, people have responded incredibly well to it. 
I think that they're responding well to the authenticity, they're responding well to the chaos, they're responding well to the spontaneity of it. Um, and if it was too planned, too designed, too ordered, it would kind of be Disneyland, it would kind of be boring, um, and it would kind of be like predictable, I guess. And why in this day and age do we need things that are predictable? We have like such the opportunity to go off in so many different directions. Um, so this is like, I guess, an important thought is that the structure empowers freedom and vice versa. And to not feel like one matters more than the other, and to to be to be open to the others. So, and this isn't just like in your creative practice or in your business. It's also like in your mind. <laughs> like allow yourself to feel that spontaneity and allow yourself to not know. Like to be in the unknown, to be in the moment of spontaneity and, um, and to allow that sort of chaos of the unplanned to exist and act on it, you know? And then, but not too much, because then you probably fuck up your life. So <laughs> also be open if you can start to see yourself unhinge and kind of going down that road too much to like put some structure in your life. Might want to eat better, might want to work out more, might want to talk to mom and dad, like, you know? And so it's like that balance between the two and being open to both. Um, arrows, <laughs> shooting <laughs> arrows. So this exists everywhere. So this exists like in music, if you think about it, like what would the Woodstock Star Spangled Banner have been had it been played just straight up and without a moment of, without the discovery in the presence, without the like, without Jimmy like, un, like, you know, experiencing the song in the moment and not knowing it. But he had to know it, right? Had to have enough structure to know it, but then had to forget it and rediscover it in the moment. Um, acting. Um, this is like one of my favorite actresses. Um, same thing. You know the script, you know the character, but in that, in that moment, you have to let go of what you know, of what you've planned, of the structure that you've developed, and you, just, and you have to be in the presence of the unknown of, of that person, of that character. Architecture, same thing. It's like tweaking just a bit, having design that is able to take a risk, not really know what it's attempting to do within the confines of structure and even basketball. Uh, I was a big sports guy, but it's like I was talking to somebody last night about this, and he was like, "Yeah, totally like, like sports too." And I said, "Yeah, you're totally right. The best basketball player isn't the one that has the absolute perfect form. It's the one who has the ability to be agile." around that form and to be able to have spontaneity and, and, cre and creativity around that. It's not just the person who's like, it's not a robot. The robot's never going to be the best basketball player. Um, and that spontaneity is what's special about humans. That's why I, I think about spirit. I think about spirit as like a key component that the machine is going to really have a really tough time developing that sort of authenticity. Um, and then it goes all the way to cities. So this city is a city that you guys know well. Um, and it's one that I love, and I think that a city can also get too structured. A city can also get too planned and suffocate the spontaneity and suffocate the creativity, suffocate the authenticity and the spirit. And then what happens with that is you end up with a city like Austin. I love Austin, but there's a lot of people who live in Austin who regret the way that they've grown. And I think there's a lot of people who contributed, you know, and so I just think that with Denver, um, we have, you have, I think, still the opportunity to value that spontaneity, to value the creativity, to value that spirit of the city, and to know that, it ha that its value needs investment. And that's from municipalities, that's from businesses, small businesses, big corporations, like feed the artist, feed the creative, feed the chaos where you can, because that's going to be the, that's why, that's, that's quality of life, that's why you live here. And don't forget that or else it's going to get suffocated too. So thank you guys, that's my presentation.
have time for maybe two or three questions. Yeah. Wow. You do exactly what you wanted to ask there. Yeah. Margaret. Hey, so I um, I finally made my first trip to New Mexico in May, and of course uh, one of the meccas was Meow Wolf, and it was great, fabulous, loved it. And the first thing that came to my mind when I was there was how um, I used to decorate at these parties in Brooklyn called Ribolog parties, and I wondered how aware you guys were of those guys and Madagascar Institute and Ghost Ship and the whole infrastructure right. of underground art around yeah. the country and what like connections were being made. Yeah, it's really, it's, it's a great question. Um, we were aware of Rhinoceropolis um, in 2007, 2008, probably the most, just because we had a Santa Fe resident that we grew up with who was up here in Denver that was part of it, Travis Egeby. And um, so that we were, we were close with. There was a, there was a theater troupe in, um, uh, in Montana, the Zula Abagata, that was really close with us, that was like touring around doing these DIY, awesome DIY theater pieces. Um, the DIY culture, we came from Warehouse 21 in Santa Fe, which was a um, nonprofit teen art center. And there we had a zine library that was ran by one of the high school kids. And through that, through the 90s, there was a lot of like zine. So like we knew through zines and the kind of production of zines what was happening in other cities. Um, so it's been, but it's, it's like, you know, it's like not, a, the network isn't like really well. So when, when Ghost Ship happened, we didn't know about Ghost Ship prior, we didn't know about its existence. But after the, the, um, the tragedy occurred, you know, seeing the videos of it, it was like, you know, that looked a lot like our old warehouses. Um, and, and, and so that was a big impetus for us, which is like, everybody's coming out against this whole network, you know, and nobody's standing up for it. And like, why? Like, is there, is it such a disconnect of like, understanding the value of this like, underground alternative arts and music culture? It's the, it is, it is the source of, the chaos, the source of the spirit, the source of the authenticity, yet nobody's coming out in support of it. And so we just felt like we had to. And so we launched the DIY fund, and now you know, we gave um, $250,000 last year to DIY um, spaces around the country. And, um, yeah, and that, I think that started this network. You know, we have a long list now. We have like hundreds of people who applied. And we have, a, you know, so it's like a really amazing database of these spaces around the country. Um, and they'll come and go, that's the thing about it, is like they're not really meant to become businesses. They're not meant to survive for 11 years like us. Like they sort of are these like momentary three to four, maybe 10 year things that create a lot of energy and then people launch from them. Um, but yeah, anyway, I think that things, I think like cities and like people like the Andy Warhol Foundation and other big arts foundations should be supporting spaces like this and understanding that like maybe they maybe they can't or they don't want to write a grant application maybe they don't want to put their address down on a piece of paper you know there's a lot of there's a lot of security reasons around that so. so my name is testing my name is Jeff Basikevich um, I appreciate you definitely taking the time um, I'm an artist myself so it's refreshing um, I love the sock moment that was totally authentic. <laughs> I'm just curious, uh, did you vet other cities around the country? Was there like a personal connection to Denver other than what you just stated about yeah. the possibilities here? So we really thought we were going to be going to Austin. Um, and we, spent, we were spending a lot of time kind of developing there. We still are, I'm still hoping to get there. But then I went to Startup Week two years ago. This is true. People were like, that's not true, this is totally true. I went to Startup Week here in Denver two years ago. And um, people were just so responsive and so loving and so welcoming. And I went back to San Fe. I was like, I was like fucking Denver, of course. Like, <laughs> you know, and <laughs> well, we're, we're just about in time. Five so, five more questions. <laughs> you want to do one more? Yeah, you can do one more. All right. That was the first one that came up. I agree. <laughs> uh, thanks. Um, so, my name is Katie, and I was wondering, as you do scale, what becomes most important to you in terms of experimentation and keeping that chaos? Like, yeah. What do you focus on? So, perfect question, perfect question to end it on, because that is really the story of Meow Wolf right now. It's like, you know, we've gone from collective, and now we're this crazy corporation, and we have a board of advisors, or a board of directors, and 
Um, we have all these divisions and division heads and employees. We have 400 employees in Santa Fe right now. And um, so it's, this is the question. It's like, same concept, can we build an, an integral enough structure around the company that doesn't, that doesn't suffocate the opportunity for the chaos within it and, and empowers the chaos within it? And so we're trying, it's just, when you start to get bureaucratic processes in and approval processes and, and protecting the brand and, you know, there's a good example is like we released a, a mariachi album um, and he just said, fuck it, we're releasing a mariachi album. So we found this, we found this really awesome mariachi band um, in, in, uh, in Las Vegas, New Mexico and Carlos Medina and we said, we want to we want to bring you guys on board, we want to produce this album, we want this album to be released by Meow Wolf. And it was spontaneous, you know, like it didn't fit the brand. I basically just said we're doing it, nobody asked questions. <laughs> You know, but like it's it's refreshing, and and it's like, and so it, we just you need to be able to build within structure the opportunity for random and and spontaneity. You know, spontaneity will never survive through systems and structure. If that makes sense. So you build your structure, but you need to let go at moments and just like let stuff happen and just say yes and turn away, kind of. Um, anyway, so yeah, great question. That's the story of our. Company, I don't know. I don't know if capitalism itself has room for this. We might just get squashed. But you know what? We try. <laughs>